Welcome everyone to the latest hot and cold list where we discuss what is hot and cold in comic books. I'm your host Brian Wood. With me as always is my co-host Jack DeMeo aka Mr. Bolo and you are watching Simple Man's Comics YouTube channel. The one source for all things comic book and pop culture related. So if you haven't done so already, Hulk smash that thumbs up button, hit that subscribe button and ring that bell so you'll be notified whenever future videos are released. Jack, what's going on buddy? Oh, happy to be here, Brian. Uh, like you said, excited to be here for another hot and cold show with our spec super team of all-star writers from comicbookinvest.com and CBSI. And we are here to bring the heat and uh, talk about things that are cooling down a little bit as well. Right. We do have a great list, hot and cold this week. And up on the screen right now, we do have the contributors. So as always, we don't make this list. This comes from the contributors that you see on the screen right now, all of them our comicbookinvest.com authors writers of fantastic articles so if you want good speculation information make sure you go to comicbookinvest.com and check out all the great articles there all right so moving right into the first pick for this week's hot list we have mr cool himself mike morello hey everybody Mike Morello from CBSI's Cover Tunes with this week's hot pick. And this week I've got to go with all things DC bronze horror. Uh, the uptick that we've seen in prices on this stuff in the last couple of years, especially this monster, House of Secrets 92, and uh, others like it, are unbelievable. And I think that even with the heartbreaking cancellation of the Swamp Thing television show, I think the books like this are going to be largely immune to the cancellation. I really do. I think that these books are going to be sought after by their fans regardless. Let's not forget we've already had bad Swamp Thing movies and a bad Swamp Thing television show. And I think that, you know, even with the cancellation, these are going to survive. There's also other huge books like some of the Neil Adams covers like this Batman 227, which is a huge, again, a monster, really tough to get in high grade. Most of these are hard to get in high grade. Um, my Two Sleepers, First Kane and First Abel from House of Mystery and House of Secrets. Um, I think if we see anything Sandman related down the road, these are going to be big books that are going to sneak up on people. And then, of course, some of the classic covers from Wrightson. Um, this one particularly, and one of my favorites, this one here. Um, and then again, favorite covers from Neil Adams, like this one here, which I think is just beautiful. There's tons of other series as well. There's The Unexpected, there's Secrets of Sinister House, there's Ghosts, there's Witching Hour. There's tons of great books in all of these. There's minor keys in a lot of them, and if we see some of these characters pop up, um, I think we're going to be pretty happy that we grab these books now. Again, hard to get in high grade, but uh, really moving up quickly in price and getting more and more sought after. That's my hot pick for the week. Thanks, everybody. So Jack, before we even get into his pick, right, I always got to comment on Mike's set, his videos. I saw like a whole bunch of, it looked like Kenner Star Wars action figures behind him. Is he like hiding out in a 1984 Kmart storage closet? Because that's what it looked like to me. And I think he was, because not only that, but you heard the music playing over the PA system, sounded like a little bit of police going on there. But he did have great pick this week. Those bronze DC horror books, I think a lot of them are undervalued. He brings up a lot of good points. He brought up some comics that aren't undervalued by any means, but like that Batman 227, one of my favorite books ever. But he also gave us a bunch of comics that are not, that aren't as valued, that have that chance of reaching up there in price. I love this pick. What do you think about it, Jack? Well, I, I do. I agree. I really like this pick. Um, I also think that while the Swamp Thing cancellation is devastating, and especially if you've watched the first two episodes of the show, um, it's a really great show, high quality show. So it leaves the, you excited as a viewer to see where the story is going to go. Um, but I live in the Carolinas. Nowhere. <laughs> yeah, nowhere. But I, I live in the Carolinas and, um, and there's been a lot of changes in the laws as far as filming and uh, some of the tax credits and largely what went on with the Swamp Thing cancellation had to do with these tax credits. Um, it really didn't have anything to do with the quality content that was being put on screen. So I, I do expect Swamp Thing to get life in some other form or fashion, but I do think it may provide buying opportunities. While I agree with Mike that people aren't going to go dumping House of Mystery 92 or Swamp Thing 1, I do think some of these dealers who are sitting on very high-priced copies hoping to maximize their profits at these summer conventions based off of Swamp Thing being on the show, 
may be more willing to come off that top end price. Um, and I could be wrong, but that's something that as a buyer, I'll be looking at going to conventions uh, this summer. But I also agree on some of his other uh, spec picks. Obviously those Neil Adams covers, they're classic and they're not going down. Uh, they're gonna do nothing but raise in value over time. They're just kind of comic uh, classics, you know, and there's really no other word for it. Um, and then I like some of the other picks. Uh, where he says Cain and Abel, you know, obviously we've seen Cain on Lucifer before, right. but that was in kind of a smaller screen role. Um, but, you know, and I'll even take it kind of outside the pick and, and look at Marvel. I also think there's similar uh, Marvel books from the same era, whether it's uh, some of the Night of the Living Monsters stuff um, to some of the, the characters in the Morbius Blade world. We've talked about this on this channel so often. Horror is hot right now. It's hot in every form, whether it's uh, traditional novels to graphic novels to monthly comics to movies tv everything horror is doing exceptionally well and i think that you're going to see different genre pockets within horror like this doing well from time to time and I, it's kind of at a point in the market where i still think there's there's growth to be had right and I, what i like is normally when you see horror get an uptick it's usually around october where you see horror get that uptick because everyone's pushing those movies but you're seeing it now i like you're seeing it organic in comics it doesn't even have to be put on the back end of a horror movie or something that's right. going out there it's just you see the natural organic growth of horror comics and he brought it up like those rights and covers those are classics that i think are going to start gaining a lot more attention as pre-code horror is already out of the reach of some a lot of buyers so that's like the next place to go especially that dc bronze horror so, well, I, feel, I feel the same way about Swamp Thing number one. I think House of Mystery 92 may be priced out of the range of a lot of collectors, but Swamp Thing one having that iconic cover, I think could be the book to get for a lot of Swamp Thing collectors going on down the road. Right. So thanks, Mike, for that fantastic pick. And that's going to kick us off for this week's hot list coming in on the little bit. With our next pick, we have the Run the Table author, Clint Jocelyn. Good afternoon, CBS Side Nation. Clint Jocelyn coming in with my hot pick of the week. And my hot pick of the week is anything regarding the fourth dimension, fourth world, and Jack Kirby's whole universe with that. So New Gods, Mr. Miracle, Forever People, a little bit of Jimmy Olsen, but those are all books that are continuing to gain steam as we roll towards the inevitable movie. But I would really start to, to look at some of these books that are affordable. Mr. Miracle 2, Mr. Miracle 4. I look at New Gods number 2. Those are books that still are affordable now and are going to pay big dividends down the road. But the whole universe as a whole is really starting to see some heavy movement. So uh, I know that Forever People number 1 just closed at about 3K um, for a CGC 9.8. I see mid-range um, New Gods number 1s going for four or 500. So you're starting to see the uptick of these books for obvious reasons. But my hot pick of the week is anything dealing with the fourth world. So I would really look at some of those books, uh, you know, First Appearance of Big Barda, uh, First Appearance of Granny Goodness, some of these books that you can have had right now at reasonable cost because, number one, if you want to flip them, they're going to have a good ROI, and they're a good long-term hold, too. Uh, we're seeing all of Jack's Kirby stuff really start to trend upwards, but specifically right now, this fourth world is really starting to move. So that's my hot pick of the week, anything related to the fourth world. Yo, fourth world problems. <laughs> there we go. Clint Johnson's pick. He's talking Jack Kirby's fourth world. We saw an uptick in him a while back right when Justice League movie was announced. So we thought we were going dark side. They went Steppenwolf, but still fell in line. You did see a lot of an uptick at fourth world titles there, and it seems like you're starting to see an uptick again. What do you think about his? What do you think about this pick, Jack? Well, I like this pick. Um, my name obviously is Jack. Um, my kid's mother's name is Kirby, so I'm a big Jack Kirby fan. But to be honest with you, this speculation really doesn't have a lot to do with Jack Kirby. I mean, I think people respect Jack Kirby and what he has brought to comics over the years, both from Marvel and DC. But this really has a lot to do with movie speculation. Um, now, DC has really derailed a lot of movie speculation with the unsuccessful releases of their last few films, minus Wonder Woman and Aquaman, which seem to have really hit with the market. Um, but of course, we're talking about Justice League, Batman versus Superman. Um, and what that has done is that's kind of made speculators kind of weary of some of these future picks. But it really seems like in the future, DC wants to get cosmic. We've seen how successful Marvel's been with cosmic releases. And we talk about genre-based movies. Comic, 
cosmic movies have replaced kind of modern sci-fi movies as these big blockbuster sci-fi releases. Guardians of the Galaxy, Star Wars, these are probably the biggest sci-fi releases that come out, uh, you know, today. So I think DC wants to cash in on that. They've got so many characters from, you know, Mr. Miracle and, um, you know, all all of the, like the fourth world, like we're talking about the forever people and Dark Side and that whole um, kind of universe of characters that they can go into. And there's a lot of first appearances that are still slept on and still under the radar. There's some of the major ones I named, obviously, are still big dollar books, but there's tons of them. And, and I think if you want to model for how this can work, look at what's happening with the Eternals right now with Marvel and the way that so many of those different first appearances are popping off. I think we can see the same thing for DC. They just need to get these movies going a little further along. The hope is with Tom King now taking the helm of the new gods movie, we will start to see this happening. Um, you know, I, I've been buying some of these Kirby books, forever people, number one, uh, new gods, number one, uh, Mr. Miracle, number one. I've been buying these books for a few years now, anticipating this movie. So I'm right there with you um, on thinking that these are good specs, but they haven't proven to really pay off yet. And we're hoping Warner Brothers films can get their act together. So we can really cash in on these the way that they should be. Right. And I agree. I do think the Jack Kirby fourth world for the longest time's been not, it's not underappreciated, but I think it has been undervalued. Especially yeah. for the, the work that Jack Kirby's done. But so there we have our, our second pick for the hot list this week. And that was from Clint Jocelyn. He's talking Jack Kirby fourth world titles. So thank you, Clint, for that pick. And rolling into the next pick this week, we have the reading pile author himself, Dan Piercy. Hey, you guys, this is Dan Piercy with dpierceyscomics.com, which forwards some article on CBSI. The reading pile. So, with DC Comics taking an absolute beating in the press this week with missteps with Swamp Thing and the DCU app, the one bright spot is we got to see those promotional photos of Gal Gadot from the Wonder Woman 84 movie. And whenever that happens, you seem to see an interest in Gal Gadot Wonder Woman Signature Series books. Uh, I myself got an increase of watchers for this, and as well as an offer over three times what I paid for this. Now, I expect the, the window for this to be very short, and you, you may be able to pick one of these up on the cheap, but uh, that's my pick, and I'm sticking to it. Wonder Woman Signature Series Comic Books. Yeah. Jack, before we go any further, I really like Dan. You know why I like Dan? No, I'm not the only one that says names wrong on this channel. But what do you think of Dan Piercy's pick? Well, I like Dan's pick. Um, you know, we obviously we've seen the promotional photos, as Dan pointed out, for the upcoming Wonder Woman 1984 movie. And there's a, a lot of buzz going about that movie. Obviously, the first one was a smash. Um, I expect the second one to do well. Um, we're going to talk a little bit later about uh, more kind of trending news as far as the Wonder Woman movie. Um, but I like this pick. These uh, signature signed um, CGC books by the celebrity actors, I really think have gotten kind of a foothold in the market uh, as these actors have made themselves more available at various conventions, whether it's Wizard World or San Diego Comic-Con. And they, they're a lot more popular than say the average signature series for a couple different reasons. First off, they're not as accessible as say a comic book writer who will be on a whole tour during the summer. Um, you know, most of these bigger named kind of actor celebrities, they're only going to do a few shows a year. The other thing is the price. If you've ever seen pricing of these signatures, they cost you a pretty penny and you're going to be waiting in a substantial line. If you can even get access at all, as most of these signings sell out. So I think that this is a trend we're going to see continue. We've seen other books spike signed by actors as well. I think it's a kind of unique niche market, um, one that may be kind of timed based on movie releases, but it's, it's one to keep an eye out for. Um, I've seen a lot of kind of cool celebrity signed books, and I think that um, that's kind of a market kind of unto itself. But again, smaller pond, but you can catch a bigger fish sometimes that way. Right, and yeah, since you started seeing more 
promo footage, like you said, of Wonder Woman 84. That just gets people and fans. Reminds them of those books, and they go back hunting for them. So, yes, that's why it's on the hot list this week. So thank you, Dan Piercy, for that pick. Hey everybody, it's Ben S, uh, CBSI Hot 10 author, uh, CBSI Tales from the Flipside podcast. Um, my hot pick this week is Good Girl Art. Um, it's always been a staple in the comic community, um, dating all the way back into the golden age. Um, but it is making a resurgence with the, uh, with the Betty and Veronica Good Girl Art. And uh, I can see this uh, uh, coming up in other... Uh, publishers as well, um, even making it all the way into, uh, you know, DC and Marvel and stuff like that. Anyway, that's my hot pick this week, Good Girl Art. And rolling into our next pick on the hot list, we have Dollar Bin Digging author Peter Renna. What's up, everybody? So, what's hot this week? For me, I'd have to say that Nova, Richard Rider, old school original Richard Rider Nova, is hot. CGC's 9.8s are up over the last couple of months. Uh, back in March, a 9.8 was about $900, but now they're selling for about $1,200. Uh, 9.6 also back in March was selling for $300, where one just sold for $450 just a few days ago. And there are a few dozen raw sales, the highest being uh, 415 for uh, my comic shop that listed theirs at 9.6. That's a raw grade, so it's their estimate. But normally they're more in the $135 range for a high grade Nova, and you can get the lower ones for under 100 bucks. But uh, they seem to be moving, as uh, speculation is that Nova will be in the next phase of the MCU. And uh, all signs are pointing that it's going to be Richard Ryder and not Sam Alexander, whose books have slowed a bit lately, but still keep an eye on them. But uh, with that said, the Abnett Landing run from 2007 is also hot with uh, some of those books moving, those great Grand Off covers. And you also get first, like in uh, issue 8 of that run, has first Cosmo, first Nowhere. And like I said, there's some great covers. So uh, Richard Ryder Nova is uh, hot and still selling. And if they do get announced anytime soon that he is going to be in the next phase of MCU, expect him to jump even more. So uh, that's what I think is hot this week. Jack, I flippin' hate Peter's pick. I hate it. I absolutely hate it. And you want to know why I hate it? Because of him and all the other news that's come out for like the past, about three months ago, I was hunting a 9.8 Nova number one. They're averaging about $800, eight to $900. And I didn't have the money for it. So I was trying to save up money to buy one. And then all of a sudden you start seeing the news come out that, you know, Nova's going to be, might be in Guardians 3 again and all this other news. And it just start picking up. And sure enough, now they're up there going for $1,400. And it's not worth, and that's out of my buying budget at that point. I don't want to buy it when it's high. I was trying to buy it when it's low. Buy where they aren't. That's what I was trying to do. I didn't want a PayPal credit, which I probably should have now. But that's why I hate his pick. Other than that, I think he's spot on. What do you think, Jack? I love the Nova pick, and I like the logic of the MCU. But I will throw kind of a wrinkle in there. And I've been saying this on multiple platforms for several months now. I'm not so sure it's going to be the Richard Ryder Nova that ends up having the impact in the MCU that we're thinking. Um, there are obviously two other Novas, you know, one being a female and one being a younger Nova who have had predominant roles within the Marvel universe, within the comics over the last couple of years. And I think if you kind of compare Richard Ryder Nova to those other Novas, I, I kind of don't think he currently would stand up. And that makes me wonder if when Marvel goes and wants a Nova for the MCU, if there won't be multiple Novas or, it, you know, it won't be a situation where um, there's a transition or maybe they skip Richard Ryder altogether. And I think that there's a natural assumption that that's the version of Nova that we're going to get. And I'm not saying we're not. I'm just saying it's a dangerous one, because as Brian pointed out, you're talking about nine eights going for fourteen hundred dollars where you can get first appearances of the other two Novas in 9.8 for 100 bucks, And, um, you know, your buy-in is a lot lower. Now, again, that's pure speculation there. We're not talking about uh, an investment based on some sort of prior knowledge. We're talking about pure speculation about what could happen. Um, but my suggestion is, rather than spending $100 on 9.8s, when you're at those shows this week, this uh, weekend, this summer, uh, you know, 
all convention season when you're at your LCS and you're hunting those back issue bins. Keep an eye out for that Marvel point one. Keep an eye out for that. Um, I think it's uh, Avengers Last Stand on, um, on Pleasant Hill. Um, you know, look, keep an eye on those two books as they are first appearances that are kind of going under the radar and are, in my opinion, as likely to be Nova as anyone else. So I agree with Peter. I think it's a great pick. Um, but I, I still think there's meat on the Nova bone by just kind of going a different route with it. And I, I wanted Nova just to have the book in my collection because that's a great book. I have a couple of raw copies, but a 9-8 I wanted in my collection. Movie speculation aside, I understand Bronze Age, a lot of copies out there exist, but I just wanted a 9-8 to have in my PC. So I'll hold off and wait for, the, for it to fall again. So thank you, Peter. Great pick and great conversation around it. And next on the hot list this week, we have Andy Spotlight writer, Andy Tomerlin. Hey, what's up, CBSI Nation? Andy here with the Indy Spotlight Series. What's hot this week? After a really cold stretch and uh, what was quite honestly going to be my cold pick, Die uh, comes comes in swinging and uh, takes over the hot spot. Uh, 50 sales alone on eBay today. Prices trending back up where you're seeing 9.8s. Now headed back towards the 150 mark for cover A's, where as they were down to the 80 and 100 mark uh, not long ago. Also, you're seeing the uh, Virgin Black variant uh, from Forbidden Planet trending back up, and I've seen one sale uh, upwards of $400 now as you were being able to get it for around $300 uh, when, the, when it died off a little bit there. <laughs> so anyway, Hot this week, Die, coming back, and uh, also watch out for Oblivion Song. Uh, it's right there as well uh, with option news. Uh, so two to watch out for. Andy gave us two picks, right? Die and Oblivion Song. And ironically, we were all talking two days ago. Andy was talking, Die was kind of cold. And then I'd brought up, hey, you know what else is kind of cold? Oblivion Song. And then boom, in one day, it crushed all of that. With word coming out that dies possibly aspirin option for a TV show, and then Deadline reporting that Oblivion Song is picked up with Robert Kirkman and Universal for a movie. So that tells you right there what might be cold is hot the next day, and vice versa. But what do you think about Andy's pick? Well, I, I love Andy's pick because it's it's one of the most kind of timely topical picks on this entire list. Um, first off, die you and I have talked about on the CBSI Bolo Show dating back to number one coming out. Um, you and I have been long advocates for the spec in that book. We've been calling that one as a major book. Um, I will also go ahead and admit that you and I kind of have had some information for a while that we've hinted at. Um, and we we told people like, you know, something's gonna happen with this. Um, we don't know what, we can't say what we do know, but we do know that something's gonna happen with this and people need to get, get in on this. So we put it out there as Simpleman's Comics Family, CBSI Nation, um, you know, to go ahead and, make those purchases accordingly. But what happens is after we put that out and kind of prices go up and more and more people are talking about die, you know, everybody moves their speculator attention elsewhere and prices started to drop. And hence why Andy brought up possibly this book being on the cold list. But as happens within the speculation community, the key collector app today um, put out information, no sourcing on this information but put out information saying that the show was that, that the book was going to be developed for a TV show. Now that's in line with what most of us in the speculation community have kind of heard rumblings of. So those kinds of confirmed reports or unconfirmed reports start to move the market. And we're seeing that. So books are doubling in price by the day. Um, probably by the time this video goes live, it'll be even more. I expect it. Um, and I think that the values are legitimate because this book is a great reader book that was built on Reader Buzz that has been called out by other industry professionals by um, from other publishers who have told us that they think that that is the book on the market right now. And uh, we've been saying for a long time it's a big show, so I'm not surprised. Uh, Oblivion Song is a little different story. It was overprinted originally on purpose so that it would ha be, have access to readers. Um, it, so copies were plentiful. They were everywhere. Um, they've been sitting at cover price forever. Um, they were even sold at many like Black Friday type sales for a dollar or a dollar fifty from like Midtown TFAW places like that. Um, so you've had plenty of opportunities to get in on this book, but I, 
I'm not surprised with what we're seeing with the prices doubling and tripling as well on that book because of the fact that, um, you know, if you read that book, it's an epic story that seems just made for a movie. And there were immediate reports of actors being attached to this property. Um, I'm not surprised it got picked up for a major movie release. I think it has a chance to do very well. I, I think the copies of those books are still out there. And I think people should keep an eye out for those. But don't be discouraged by that high print run because also remember there's no late prints. So a book like Die has five printings um, and multiple store variants. And a book like Oblivion Song does not have that. So while it does have a huge print run, um, it doesn't have that. Um, those other printings, but also be on the lookout for that advanced copy trade paperback that went to stores before the book came out, um, which is a kind of first appearance. If you think, if you believe first appearances can come from trade paperbacks, as well as that um, statue special edition collector's box, which seems to be really moving on the secondary market today. Um, those two, I think are going to really, kind of pace the market, but uh, keep an eye out for those low hanging fruits, those cheap number one copies of both books sitting available at LCSs. So there you have it folks, Die and Oblivion Song, both great picks from Andy this week. And rolling into the next hot pick, we have the mask speculator himself, author of True First, Topher S. I gotta be quiet. My ex Patricia the Alpaca's around here somewhere and I'm supposed to be trimming her lawn. This week's hot pick, Akira. Now that we know the film is moving forward, rare items and comics are starting to go nuts. Vintage models and t-shirts are on the top of the list. Normally, after new announcements, we see a spike, then a sharp decline, but some stuff is staying strong. My picks, if you can find them, high grade issue ones from Epic, any issue after 35, and I think the McFarlane toys from 2000 are sleeping. Well, I'm off to service the queen and then visit some friends over at the Polo Show. Catch me next week, yeah! Turns out we don't have the mass speculator. We had another appearance from FOMO the Puppet, and he's talking Akira. Not Shakira, but Akira, right, Jack? Right, and it figures that a uh, puppet would bring up Akira. You know, something that has kind of long been attached to um, kind of animated lore, and it is now apparently on the verge of hitting the big screen. And we've seen a lot of Akira speculation over the years and kind of ebbs and flows with Akira. But I, it, like FOMO the Puppet pointed out, it seems like we are ready to move forward at this point and uh, that that this is getting more serious and it, it's got speculators and collectors a lot more serious. That we're, now is the time to lock in those key issues. And of course, you know, on top of number one, you know, those late issues are in, in huge demand. They're so low printed. They're so tough to get in high grade. Um, so I think that a lot of Akira stuff is going to probably pop in the secondary market. And I can agree more or with the puppet that those, uh, those tough black borders are really going to make all the difference in the world. What condition you can find books in is going to be key. And I'm seeing a big trend in this list tonight, and we're talking about a lot of option news. And it's funny that we're talking about option news in mid-June when you know the big time for it's going to come in a month from now when SDCC happens, right? Right. A lot of this is kind of almost SDCC anticipation. Yes. I have a feeling that's where, like, the die news leaking out is coming from and things like that is people preparing for their big SDCC reveals. Right. It's like movie torrents but it's comic news instead that's getting leaked <laughs> yes yes so I expect to see an uptick again when some of these kind of leaked talked about um in production movies and tv shows end up being kind of more official and more concrete especially around san diego comic-con time you may see some of these uh different titles and books kind of re-spike right so there we have FOMO's pick and rolling into the last pick this week. Or we have Mel V from the Mighty Mel V YouTube channel. He does not have a video for us this week, but he did give us his pick. And I'm going to bring it up on the screen right now. And his pick is Blank Variants. We just talked about San Diego Comic-Con. We are deep into con season. And he says with con season upon us, I'm starting to see a higher desire for Blank Variants. And they're even starting to pop up with store variants. So what do you think about this, Jack? Well, I'm kind of on both sides of the fence of what he's talking about here. I, I hate, I'll just start with the bad part. I hate uh, blank store variants because I just don't think, I, I like the fact that they're creating unique books, 
that aren't available to the market. But I think it's an utter racket, the prices that are being charged for them, because you and I both know, because we're involved in the production of store variants, that, you know, there's no additional cost to doing that. So, you know, there's probably a slight one for putting that blank cover on, but to, to upcharge most of those books to, to kind of $15 level seems silly when that those are books that are then going to be bought and then have to have further money paid to put sketches on. Now, getting that negative aside, I like blank cover spec. It, it is a timely spec, but we talk about that with speculation being, you know, all about timely. In the summertime, you can make some money on blank covers, but there's kind of some keys to knowing what covers are going to make money and which ones aren't. Um, the first suggestion I would have is do your research. Books that do not have multiple blank covers of the same title are going to do better. So what do I mean by that? Well, if there's multiple Batman blank covers, then a new Batman blank isn't going to do anything. Um, where we've seen success is when a, a cover had been done for a while. So a Wolverine blank had been done years and years ago, and there hadn't been one for years. And the old one had kind of an old style trade dress. So when there was a new Wolverine blank uh, for X-23's Wolverine, we saw that book go to kind of like $10, $15, 20 in the market immediately. Not necessarily because of what the guts of the book were, but people wanted a Wolverine sketch. Wolverine's a popular character. So you want to do your research in the market, see where what popular characters don't have a lot of sketches available. Keep an eye out for those. And then the other thing to look for is those clearance sale sketch books. Um, whenever you're looking at, like we talked about midtown sales or things like that, you'll see blank variants available for a dollar. That's the time to buy them. If you're going to do live sales at conventions, most dealers will tell you that you can make an absolute fortune from a $5 blank cover box because you can buy these books for a dollar to $3 on clearance. And you can sell these books regularly for, you know, like I said, about $5 just for random books um, for people to buy and then go and get sketched. Um, and, you know, I, I myself have flipped a lot of $1 to $5 blank variants, and I have no problem doing that. So whenever I can get my hands on popular characters at those cheap prices, I will do that. So those are the kind of the two ways I would suggest to keep an eye out for blank variants is look for those rare ones that you think, you know, could be kind of sleeper money makers. And then also look for, you know, just the cheap ones that you can turn around and flip and keep an eye out to who's going to various cons, because obviously the cons where an artist worked on that book, those books are going to do better. So do your research, do your homework, and you can make some money on this. But it, it's definitely more for an advanced speculator than a novice. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, especially if you're setting up at a con or um, if you know people that are at a con that are dealing and they don't have any blank variants. If you know what artists are there and you know what books are popular, you can either set, trade them to the dealers. You might even get more on trade, right, than you would selling cash if the dealer wants them to sell them himself. But definitely check out what artists are going to be at cons and that are doing sketches and commissions and then get those blank variants accordingly. And then unload them at the con for, but you can definitely make some money, if, especially if you buy them cheap, like Jack said, on those discount and clearance sales before you go. But, right. I, I, a couple of years ago, I went to Heroes Con, who, where I'll be this weekend covering the event for CBSI and Civil Men's Comics. And um, I had picked up 20 copies of a Rocket Raccoon blank, and Scotty Young was there. And I brought him with me to the convention. I didn't know what I was going to do with him, but I ended up talking to a dealer buddy of mine who ended up paying me $5 each for them. And then he sold them for $10 each right. because people were so desperate for Scotty Young uh, kind of quick say he was doing kind of like a quick sketch on a book for like 50, 60 bucks at the time. His, his prices have gone incredibly up since then. Right. But, um, but, you know, people were willing to pay that $10 for that. Like I was shocked that I sold them all for $5 each. So you, you really, you really never know. Um, so yeah, Brian's exactly right. I, you know, if you, you, especially if you can catch a dealer who who's not prepared, who who's looking for those books. And then Brian's right about the trade too, because you can get more in trade a lot of times than in direct sale. Right. And on the other side of that, if you are setting up at a con, make sure you do your homework ahead of time, buy those blanks, and then market it that way. Put little signs that say, get it signed by so-and-so that's at, or, you know, or sketched by so-and-so that's at this con. I mean, that's huge marketing and people like you'll be surprised how unprepared people are going there. And then they start scrambling and wanting those books to get a sketch. Right. I've right. done it myself. <laughs> right. We all have, we all have. And, and you, when you catch somebody who's a little unprepared, that's when you can make a little bit of profit. 
So yeah, so put those signs out, put the table numbers of the, of the artists on your sign. Let people know where they can take those books and get them signed and get them, and get them signature and uh, get them uh, sketched. And you'll be surprised how many you'll sell. There's, it's a good market and one that a lot of people are kind of leaving on the table. So that racks up this week's hot list. We're going to not even take a break. We're going to roll right into the freezer. And I'm talking not just getting some pizza rolls here. We're going to go right into the cold picks. Starting with Ben Stein, Mr. Hot 10 himself. Hey, guys. It's Ben S. back here again um, with my cold pick this week. Um, besides the U.S. national men's soccer team, come on, guys. Uh, the women got it going on. You got to step your game up. You can't be getting beat by Venezuela three to nothing. That's terrible. But anyway, as far as comics are concerned, um, my cold pick for this week is uh, signature series books. Um, I've long been um, against them, but uh, here recently you just kind of look through completed sales, and it's just non-sale after non-sale after non-sale. Um, there are a few here and there that sell, but. If you're trying to invest in signature series books, um, you're putting your money in the wrong place. Uh, just remember, by as soon as you get somebody sign that book, um, half your selling audience uh, goes away. And if it's somebody that's not really heard of, um, even it can be a much higher percentage than that. Um, you don't want that. You don't want your your to push your audience away. So, anyway, my co pick this week: signature series graded books. So there we have it, Jack. That is Ben's cold pick. I will agree with him to a certain extent. Let's say, hey, I this is this might be a bad analogy, but this is how I see it. Also, I buy a house. It has a freaking underground pool in it. Great, awesome, love that pool. It's so great. It's such an amenity to me. But now when I go to sell that house, I limited the market because half the market doesn't want to deal with the pool, doesn't want to buy with the pool. So he makes a great point about that about buying books that have a limit market value or reduces the audience for market resale but i also think depending on who signed that book and how hot that book is depending on the time you list it and sell it could be beneficial but i do see why it's on the cold list me most of the time if i buy an ss book it's for pc anyways with no gonna stay in my collection i'm not gonna sell it it's someone that i wanted but i do see why he has it on the cold pit so I like this pick too, but I think it's nuanced depending upon what you're talking about as far as a signature series book. Um, this is probably the, the kind of entry that I'm most excited to talk about because there's so many different ways to look at this pick. Um, I get what he's saying in totality. Part of it is the way the markets move. Signature series has been very popular with these kind of new age collectors. And Brian, you and I talk about um, the market kind of almost forgetting that there's a whole new group of 20 something collectors and a lot of them are coming from sports cards as well as sports cards kind of booming right now and if you look at sports cards what is the thing that everybody wants in sports cards they want that autographed card so i think some of that is that mentality of the new age collector kind of valuing that signed slabbed book having said that that's created a market where we're seeing facilitators now now, shout out to all my facilitators out there. I'm not downing facilitators. Um, you know, our, our boy Nick Dortman over at Slab Heroes does a lot of facilitation and things like that. But that market has created an added kind of cost structure. So now I got to pay for the book. I got to pay for the grading. I got to pay for the witnessing. I got to pay for the facilitation of the whole thing. And if you're pressing or anything like that, once you start looking at what you're into those books for, it becomes expensive. And when you start looking at how plentiful, even uh, A-list artists like Art Germ, look at how plentiful Art Germ signed books are. Um, that's where I think Ben is coming from. Um, another thing to look at is keys. Uh, when you're getting a major key um, signed. So like, again, I'll be at Heroes Con this weekend. So this is fresh on my mind, this topic. Um, I don't necessarily believe in taking, say, Secret Wars 8 over to John Beatty and Mike Zeck and getting them to double sign that book. Um, I think you're, t again, like Ben said, you're taking away a key collectible on the market and now you're limiting it to signature series. Where I like signature series books, though, is we just talked about blank covers and Scotty Young. So I'm going to bring it back to that. Um, how many Scotty Young books are available for sale on clearance sales? coming when it comes Black Friday and any of these 70% off sales for a dollar and a dollar fifty. How many Scotty Young books have you found in dollar boxes? 
but he has a market. There's people that love his stuff. And I do well with ungraded signed Scotty Young books. That's a bolo for you guys. You can get 15 to 20 bucks for an ungraded signed Scotty Young. But since I know that, I also know that I can command more for a signed and graded Scotty Young. So if I get, and they, these are real books that I've bought for a dollar that I plan on bringing with me to Heroes Con, things like Angela, um, number one, Scotty Young variant, um, books like The Ultimates, number one, Scotty Young variant. You bring uh, Captain Marvel, you bring books like that where you paid a dollar, two dollars, and you're paying nothing to get them signed. And then you're getting them graded for around twenty dollars. You end up looking at a very low cost of entry for a collectible. Again, you're not marketing the comic now. You're marketing the signed book as the entity. And yes, that does limit your market. But when you're playing ball on that lower end, you can make good money. I sell a lot of those types of books for $75, $80, and I'm very happy with that profit. Um, it, it takes me very little time. Um, it, it, it doesn't really put out a whole lot of risk. And I feel like at that price that I'm buying in at, as long as I'm making sure I'm getting those nine eights, then I can go ahead and and feel confident doing that. Um, DC cover Bs are great for that. Uh, you know, if you're at a convention where Adam Hughes, I have some Adam Hughes DC cover Bs. I have um, some Jenny Frizen DC cover Bs. Those are, are are great items, I think, that you can make money on getting them signed and graded because they're not going to cost you a whole lot. But if you're spending money on keys and trying to get those signed and graded. Or if you're going through facilitators and you're spending a fortune to get your books signed and graded, then you're kind of probably fighting a losing battle because um, your expectations of your return are going to be too high. But I think there is a market for signed and graded books. I just think most people do it wrong. I think kind of the cheaper end books are the better books to get signed and graded and to try to make flip money on signed and graded books. And moving on into the next pick on the cold list this week is from Topher S., the true first author, slash FOMO the puppet, slash mass speculator. So I'm not sure who we're going to get on this video, but let's take a look and find out. What's up, speckers? It's the mass speculator, and tonight I'm taking on my mortal enemy in a guns out barbed wire steel cage match. Only way to win, choke out your opponent with an X-Force polypay. But before I take on the lurker, I've got some cold for you to chug on. I'm talking about the cheetah. Wonder Woman 274, 275, issue 9, the first full and modern cover. They're all cold. I'm telling you. No, I'm ordering you to get off your jelly duff. Get to a keyboard. It's buy time, bubba. Soon as we see wig in a skin-tight latex cheetah suit, these books are gonna disappear. My pick? Justice League 13 sketch variant or combo. You can find the Water 100 sketch cover for 15 bucks right now. What the hell is going on? See you tonight at the match and remember, bring your poly bags to throw in the ring. So I like Topher's pick because he he turned it into a, a cold into a very big positive and he's talking about Cheetah books right. So Cheetah has cooled down because Comic speculators have short attention spans. They go after right. the shiny object. Cheetah hasn't been the shiny object lately, but that is going to change real soon. Topher's even recognizing it. So he even gave some issues to be picking up. But what do you think about this pick, Jack? Well, I, I totally agree. Um, I've talked about Cheetah on this channel before because I think Kristen Wiig is going to kill that performance. If you've, been, if you've been watching her since her Saturday Night Live, as she's kind of branched out beyond comedy, she has pushed herself more and more to play roles outside that traditional box, and she's gotten critical acclaim for it, and I think this is going to be a big breakout role for her. Um, I will say that I like a lot of the modern um, Cheetah appearances. I would say be on the lookout for New 52 Justice League 13 Alex Garner 125 that shows Wonder Woman fighting Cheetah. I would say be on the lookout for the upcoming Villains Month Jenny Frizen Cheetah variant. I would say be on the lookout for that Year of the Villains. Uh, I believe it's, what, 1 in 100? um our term uh -huh. cheetah variant yeah I, I would say keep an eye out for those because all of those are undervalued and i'll i'll be fully transparent they're all books i've picked up over the last year because i believe in what i think kristen wig is going to do in this performance i think wonder woman 1984 is going to be a hit i think kristen wig is going to be a hit in the movie i think the character cheetah is going to be a hit we haven't had a lot of big time female villains in if you really think about it marvel or dc there really hasn't been a big time 
female villain who's carried a movie. So I think she has an opportunity to really connect with an audience. Also, Cheetah can kind of be flipped and play the good guy at some point. So I think there's a lot of potential with Cheetah, um, possibly a future Suicide Squad appearance. Um, imagine Krista Wig getting to be in kind of a comedy role there. Um, so I, I, I really believe in Cheetah, and I think now's the time to buy. Um, like Brian said, it's spec is, you know, it, it's all about what's what you've done for me lately. And no one's talking about Cheetah right now. And DC has been real kind of coy to release images of her from the movie. I think they're going to save that, that you're not going to see until like those, maybe those trailers yeah. drop. Um, so that's going to be a stealth buy for a while. So these cold picks are always great opportunities to get in on some good deals. We're going to keep rolling on into the cold list. And next up, we have Run the Table author once again, Clint Jocelyn. Good afternoon, CBSI Nation. This is Clint Jocelyn coming to you with my cold pick of the week. And my cold pick of the week is the Ascender, Descender storyline slash universe uh, by Jeff Lemire. Uh, when we look at the, the sender, it's got a cult following that's done really, really well, but unfortunately has dropped. Um, you're seeing CGC number ones selling for 50 bucks, um, so basically at cover. And then we're seeing a sender, which was a critical acclaim, but really never got out of the gates very well at all in terms of sales. Uh, retail summit for issues are going for as low as $15, uh, which is really low. Um, you're seeing copies go at cover. So I, I it just, this, it really went off with a whimper, uh, especially after what happened with Descender. So these books are cold right now. Um, I think you're seeing a little bit of trend with this, uh, with all image books, but I wanted to specifically focus on these two right now, uh, which is unusual for Jeff Lemire. So unfortunately, my cold pick of the week is a Cinder Descender and that whole storyline. Perhaps we'll see an uptake later on if more people catch on to it, but right now, ugh, it's cold. So there we have, Jack. We have Clint talking about Ascender, Descender. Descender was really hot, especially with the whole Jeff Lemire buzz. Um, there's option news tied behind it at one point. Ascender came out. I really liked the first issue, but sometimes reading doesn't make it hot. We had reading comics as a hot pick last week. But just because you read it doesn't mean the spec is there. And I kind of see where they're talking about the story might be good, but we're not seeing the prices escalate. And I think a lot of people started falling off on Descender, so it's hard to get that traction built back up again with that follow on a sender book. But that's my opinion. Jack, what do you think about this pick? No, I agree. And it, this is, again, just kind of similar to the last topic we talked about. Is this is just the spec cycle. Um, you know, this book was optioned immediately. And sometimes when that happens, that's bad because you get that initial pop to $10. And then the book sits on a shelf somewhere. They need more story. I think I really think that's why we're getting the sender like too. Like I, I think whatever studio option the book, they want more time to look at things and to figure out what they're doing. There were some major actors, if I'm not mistaken, attached to it originally. Um, so I, I, again, a buying opportunity. Absolutely. Because I absolutely think that the, you will see the sender books available in boxes. There was a lot of store variants as well. So I know there's been some cheap store variants out there. But this was a property that was real hot on Hollywood's radar. And things like this don't go away. So I would keep an eye on this one. Um, I, I totally agree that it's cold right now. But that to me, that just means buying opportunities. Um, it's a book I've actually got a lot of copies of. So it's not one that I'm out actively seeking. It's one I'm hoping comes to fruition and something happens. But you just don't know. But that's what these image series are all about. You got to buy them and hold them. Because we saw this week with both Die and Oblivion Song, all it takes is an app alert, a, a deadline article, um, something to come out that suddenly blows the market up. Right, and I just looked it up real quick. It was Sony back in 2015 as soon as Descender came out. Had, and evidently there was other Hollywood production companies competing for it, and ultimately it was Sun Sony. So you never know. Like I say... We always say cold list could be a good time to buy up some of these books, especially if it has buzz behind it and it was option. There's another one that I was rooting for, and that was Rat Queens back in the day. Got option for like an animated series. Hadn't heard much since then, but still love that book, especially the first volume. So I still pick those up when I find them cheap. Especially that Fiona Staples number one variant. But Yeah, definitely. With that being said, we're going to move into the final pick of our cold list this week, and it comes from Mr. Cool, Mike Morello. Hi again, everybody. 
Mike with the cold pick for the week, and this week I've got to go with DC's Vertigo line, which they have decided to cancel in total. Um, unfortunately, I'm not really sure why. I assume it's because of poor sales. This is obviously heartbreaking to a lot of us 80s babies who grew up on such things as Sandman and Hellblazer, Preacher, Swamp Thing, that kind of stuff. Um, and it may not affect the old Copper Age stuff. We'll, we'll have to wait and see what happens with that stuff. Um, most of those things have pretty diehard fans, and they may not suffer all that much. But we'll, what will suffer is going to be this modern stuff like the Sandman universe, um, books like The Dreaming, Lucifer... Um, House of Whispers, Books of Magic, things like that. But it also affects the books that have seen some heat over the last year, like High Level, Border Town, Hex Wives, things like that. So if you've been holding on to any of that stuff, I think it's time for you to let it go. I don't think there's going to be really much moving forward in the way of that. Hopefully we'll see some of the really good characters like Sandman pop up in another book, much like he did in Metal, or like Swamp Thing has in Justice League Dark. And we're talking about some of the greatest characters to ever grace comics, and uh, written by some of the greatest writers to ever write for comics. So hopefully this isn't the darkest days for these characters. Hopefully we'll see them pop up elsewhere, and hopefully this doesn't mean the very end of possibilities for these characters to pop up in television or movies. But for right now, this stuff is ending. Ending. It is canceled. It is cold. Have a great week, everybody. Thanks. We just heard, as Mr. Cool said himself, that DC Vertigo has been is canceling their books. What do you think about this pick? Well, yeah, this has been sad news in the comics community. Um, but, you know, brands go like this. Um, the Vertigo brand was hot when we were younger. Um, but, again, we talk about this. The market is moved by this kind of young up and coming speculator and collector and they just don't have that same nostalgia feel that we do for these characters and as much as we may love these characters people weren't buying these books so obviously people didn't love them that much and let's be honest you can't recreate magic so no new sandman book was going to ever do for you what that original sandman book did so i agree with mike that i don't think those original books are going to lose steam and value um I do think that the some of the new creator-owned books will can still find a home on DC Comics on some other imprint. I think they might shift over that whole DC Black Label. Right. You have Black Label. You have Wonder Comics. So you have a few other um, labels that are doing well within uh, DC. And then the other thing is we saw with uh, Daniel the Endless showing up in the Justice League comic and kind of causing a stir last year. Um, we know that it is possible for these characters to branch out. I personally would love nothing more than to see Lucifer, Constantine, Swamp Thing, all within the DC universe. Um, I would love nothing more than to see a depiction of Lucifer like Tom Ellis played on the show um, within, within that era of the universe. We're talking about horror being hot, um, this kind of dark occult stuff being hot. DC could have a, a real hit on their hands by taking these characters that have been popular and just adding them in with some of their other characters. Um, Justice League Dark is the perfect kind of avenue for that. So I think Sandman, um, you know, all of those characters, Death, uh, could all fit into a Justice League Dark type of universe that I think would do very well on the big screen, as well as if they wanted to do some sort of Netflix deal. And I really think everything, Vertigo is probably going away, but they're probably just... They're going to rebrand it or do something. And a lot of those titles that we liked from Vertigo will have different but future titles along the same lines. There'll probably be some other imprint that comes out that is that flashy, shiny object at that time that people are going to love. Yeah, and DC went through this with Young Animal. So yeah. when they tried to get as popular as Gerard Way is and as much he as Doom Patrol has seen with the TV show, um, he was unable to get that imprint really going off the ground. We've seen the same thing with other companies like IDW and their Black Crown label. So um, it's hard to get these subset labels going because people are so used to the branding of typical label, which is, again, why I'm advocating DC Comics. You want to make a smart move. Just integrate these characters into your stories. You've got the writers uh, on board that can do this. Right. My favorite book from the Young Animal imprint was Mother Panic, by the way. Love that book. Great book. Tied into Gotham, tied into the Batman universe. I could definitely see that if they wanted to transition over into those main, the Batman detective. Definitely. But, definitely. Uh, definitely. I, I definitely think that's a good, a great example. Yeah. 
So I, I would like to see that. I think that's what they're gonna try to do with a lot of these young animal books, especially with like the Doom Patrol series being kind of successful on DC app. So, um, and again, I can't advocate enough for how good Swamp Thing is. Those first two episodes I've really enjoyed. Um, it's more old school Swamp Thing than I thought it was gonna be. So I, I, I think that, um, I think there's gonna be a calling for whether it's a Swamp Thing movie or another Swamp Thing TV show at some point. And I think that Constantine, Lucifer, all those guys could, would be great with it in that. Yeah. DC, get your shabooboo together. Right. And with that, we have ourselves the hot and cold list for this week. Jack, looking at this list, give me two things that stick out. Well, a couple things that stick out to me right off the bat, and just looking at the hot list, I would say, is this image option news. If you've Got books already. It's time to pull them out of your long boxes. If you don't have the books, I think uh, Die may be tough to buy cheap, but Oblivion Song is still out there, so be looking for that. Um, the other one I would say is this Kirby Fourth World stuff. Uh, start your research process. Start getting into that stuff because I definitely think DC Comics wants to go in that direction. Is there anything on the cold list, Jack, that sticks out to you? Well, yeah, definitely. I think um, my favorite one on the cold list, like we talked about, is the Signature Series uh, one because I just think that – there's a lot of opportunities in signature series and a lot of mistakes you can make. So I, I do understand why it's cold, but I think that there is a lot of more research that needs to be done on how to become profitable on that. And it's similar to what we talked about with the blank variants. I think it's not a novice speculation move, but if you're already kind of making gains in the speculation game and you want to add a new wrinkle to your game, that could be one for you. So I really like that one. I think Ben brought up some great points in that video. So that, like we said, there's the hot and cold list for this week. It is important to remember that list is exclusively released on this video first. So make sure you have that subscribe and you click that bell notification every Wednesday, 9 p.m. premiere, except some sad news. We will not have one for next week because I will be going on vacation. I will be out of town. I will be down in Tampa with my wife and kids down to see family. So... I can't say every week because we will not have one next week, right, Jack? Right, right. But again, we will be content collecting all weekend at Heroes Con this weekend in Charlotte, North Carolina. So stay tuned to the Simplements Comics YouTube channel because while we are taking a week off, we are going to hit you with a whole lot of content. So Jack, before we go, is there anything else you want to tell the watchers and listeners? June 17th, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Simplements Comics YouTube channel, the Indie Spotlight series show comes back with a brand new episode with Vault Comics. And be sure, guys, to be on the lookout for that brand new Bolo box available at the Simplemans Comics Patreon page. Check out that link in the description. Right. So we are we have one spot left for the premium box, and I there is six spots left for the regular Bolo box. Just want to put that out there. Again, we allocate the spots in those boxes. That way we're able to provide quality comics in those boxes. And tomorrow night we are live on the Bolo show. And immediately after the Bolo Show on Simple Man's Comics YouTube channel, you will find the first episode of the FOMO Show. FOMO the Puppet. It's going to be his own little mini episode. So make sure you're paying attention to that. And with that being said, guys, the next Hot and Cold will premiere live Wednesday night, 9 p.m. on June 26th. Thanks for watching.